All right. Welcome, everyone, to Sirius's Leadership IQ Series. If you've attended one of these events in the past, welcome back. If you're new here, we're glad that you're here. Simply put, here at Sirius, we build leadership teams for companies large and small in all industries all over the world. We're able to deliver on that promise based on the executives that we have in our network. These are the results-oriented people-focused leaders that you want in your company. If you are one of those executives, that value statement makes sense to you and you align with that, there's an entire ecosystem for you here at Sirius to become an even better leader. We have an executive resource page. We're going to drop the link to that in the chat box below. Uh, that gives you a number of the resources that you see on your screen here uh, to just hone your skills, align with what you do best, that way you can do that on repeat, uh, and just really articulate uh, what you are better at than anyone else on the planet. We also give you the opportunity on calls like this to learn from other executives in the network and to meet people uh, because life's always done better together. If you own or run a business, there's an entire ecosystem for you that we support here at Sirius. I could talk about this for the next 22 minutes, uh, but I'm a little biased as to how we help clients. So there's a link in the chat box uh, for what our clients actually say. It's better if you hear it uh, from them uh, than it is if you hear it from me. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Today is a continued conversation that... Gary, I guess we started six months ago, and then we restarted again last week. So when Kristen mentioned Tuesday rituals, you're kind of becoming my Tuesday ritual, right? I wake up on Tuesday morning. What do I have on the calendar? Well, Gary Lehman's what I have on the calendar. So Gary's an EOS implementer, leader of businesses, uh, just a great operational mind. And we're really fortunate to have him both in the Sirius Executive Network and on today's Leadership IQ. Gary, thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. Uh we could do this every Tuesday. I would love that. Well, I would love it too, because our conversations are pretty seamless. Uh, we don't have to prep for hours and hours for them because we're both on the same page. And we've both seen how these leadership abilities can really help move businesses forward. One of the things that we get a lot, uh, you and I, is this idea clients being stuck, right? Or they're hitting a ceiling, which is kind of what we've been addressing on this series when we talk about hitting the ceiling, Gary, what exactly do we mean? What does that look like? Yeah, so hitting the ceiling is literally just that. You're, you're, you're cruising along and all of a sudden you just get stuck and you've tried lots of different things and nothing, nothing seems to be working anymore. Um, and that happens individually. It happens, you know, in a company organization, it could happen in a department. When you, when you hit the ceiling, you run out of either capacity, you're wearing too many hats, you're doing too many things, or what got you here won't get you there, right? There's that inflection point, that moment where you're not really sure what happened. You can't really predict when it's coming, but you've hit that ceiling. And, you know, at the core, what, what I help my clients understand is that's inevitable. That makes you normal. It's true for every growing organization. And so to the ability that you can master the five leadership abilities of which we're going to cover two today, that not only allows you to more quickly and efficiently, effectively break through that ceiling, but it can help you identify and prolong where you're going to hit your next ceiling because it will happen. Unfortunately, everybody who blasts through a ceiling or two, hey, congratulations, you're going to hit that ceiling again. It is repetitive. It's just it's normal. It happens to everybody in every organization. So you mentioned that it happens to every organization, but not every organization sees it coming. So last week we talked about an organization's ability to predict. You said a couple of things in last week's session. Uh, and Christine, if you would drop the, the link for the LinkedIn post for that, uh, in that post, you'll be able to connect with Gary, myself, Sirius. You'll also be able to watch last week's if you didn't, if you weren't on for it. You said a couple of things that uh, I think are intuitive to hear but it's not something that we might have originally thought of. And when we talk with business leaders about predicting, seeing things coming, we usually default to one year, three year, five year. 
But on last week's call, you said that's really the long, the wrong time horizon. Give us some clarity there. Yeah. So, so one of the one of the ways that you can tell a ceiling's coming, right? Because, like I said, it's, it's often a surprise. All of a sudden, just things are not working the way they did before. It's the ability to really tackle today's issues, right? So predict. We talked about last week. It's the you know it's people some think- sort of future three year plan, strategic plan. It it actually starts with. Are you identifying the right problems to solve this week? The ones that are causing you to get stuck, the ones that will derail you. They're not derailing necessarily today, but if we're not, if we're working around those issues, we're not solving them at their root. Well, they're going to come back to bite and come back to bite. So oftentimes people get surprised because it's kind of a confluence. Multiple issues that have been kicked down the road all of a sudden crash the system. So the ability to identify the right problems to solve, the ones that are going to derail your your quarterly goals, your annual plan, those are the ones, the better that you can really take ownership and solve those, the more likely you're going to reach your projections, right? Your goals. And so it improves your chance to predict. It also delays that ceiling, right? Uh, So many many companies that that I work with, they're, they're really just duct tape and twine holding everything together, right? And eventually that breaks, but you don't know when it breaks. It's like, you know, your motor's going to blow up one day, but you don't know which mile it's going to blow, right? So have you have you been looking at the warning lights? Have you been changing the oil, right? Have you been dealing with the things that you know are going to prolong that engine? And you gave us a framework last week for working through those warning lights, working through those problems, uh, the conversations that should happen around a leadership table he gave us a framework you called IDS. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so IDS is the way that we teach solving problems at the root and making them go away for the long-term greater good of the organization. IDS stands for identify, discuss, and solve. So identify means state the problem in a way that you create the discussion to get to the root. Oftentimes, what's stated as the issue isn't the root cause of that issue. So you discuss openly until you understand what's causing the issue, the root cause. But leadership teams, they're decision teams. They're not discussion teams. And so often, people want to stay in the discussion loop. What what we find is as a leadership team gains trust with each other, they're able to open and honestly communicate. And identify the issue as external, right? It's it's us solving the issue, not an issue between people. It kind of becomes obvious who should take accountability for solving that issue, right? You, you can kick around for a long time because nobody wants to raise their hand and say, okay, I'm going to take some action. Finally going to take some, I'm going to deal with this people issue. I'm going to deal with this bad vendor that's been causing problems. Or I'm going to just finally bite the bullet and retrain my team, whatever that looks like. Stepping up and taking ownership, right? The accountability to solve. That's what changes the leadership team from a discussion group to a decision making group. I think that point about leadership teams or decision teams is really helpful as a foundational element for the conversations that we're continue to have through this series, especially when we bring in uh, these next two topics. So a lot of things to talk around about around simplify and systemize, uh, but more than just the discussion, I think there's some key decisions that have to happen here. So, Gary, tell us about these two new leadership abilities to the conversation, simplify, systemize. So I'll start with simplify. I, this is this is one that's I think everybody kind of gets in theory, right? Make Keep it simple, right? We've heard the keep it simple, stupid, mm-hmm. simple, simple is better. Right. Simplify. The problem is, if you're familiar with the concept of entropy, the universe wants to go to disorder all the time. Everything wants to go to disorder all the time. It doesn't matter where you begin and you you, you file correctly every day. Right. But eventually, all of a sudden, your things get complicated. Every time you add someone to the organization, believe it or not, like it is geometric progression to complexity. 
and and it 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 happens incrementally and it happens over time and so you kind of absorb and absorb and all of a sudden there's this massive complexity everywhere the concept of simplify is is really about what are we trying to achieve and are we doing it in the most efficient way possible right so I, I love the story. It, 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 I think it fits really well. A young lady wants to learn how to make grandma's bread. So she has her mom and they go through the whole recipe. And then at the end of the recipe, the mom cuts off the two ends of the bread and puts in the oven, right? And the daughter said, well, why do we do that? She goes, that's how grandma did it. So we go to grandma and grandma does the same thing. She gets the end, she cuts the two pieces off, she puts it in the oven. She asks her grandmother, well, why do we do that? She goes, well, that's how my, you know, my mother taught me. Well, why do you cut the two ends of thread? And she goes, well, my mother used to use a little wood stove and it was only this big. So you had to cut the ends off. Those things are throughout your organization. There are, there's parts in your organization that made sense at the time, if you will. But if you really just take a moment and step back to anything you're doing, you're going to find all those steps in the process, if you will, that have been baked in, no pun intended, over time that just don't need to be there. And every single time you take an unnecessary or non-value added step out, you are simplifying, right? And simplify shows up throughout the organization. It's in the structure. I stole, I stole a great quote from a fellow implementer. Um, I don't know if you're aware, matrix is from the Latin word meaning does not work. Okay, like a matrix organization is the opposite of simplify. Who who who's accountable for my results? Right? When two people are accountable, nobody's accountable. So even what you would not necessarily see as something that simplifies an organization, clear lines of authority, clear lines of accountability. That's an act of simplification. Right? Um, I could I can go on and on, Chris, about simplify but the one thing that i'll tell anybody is i i challenge everybody give me a give me an example of when complex beats simple and i i, I haven't lost that debate yet right simple is faster quicker cheaper easier to train easier to maintain right but we yeah. lean towards complex because we think complex has got to be better 98 percent of the time simple is better so as we're looking at most of us, especially in these roles that we serve on leadership teams, we're not starting from scratch. We're coming into those existing matrix organizations. Maybe we're looking, my favorite is the dotted line on the org chart, right? Or the 12 dotted lines on an org chart, which is usually where I go, this assignment's not for me, right? And I just got to kind of walk out. <laughs> um, so when we walk into these organizations, we're not walking into a blank slate. There's a degree of complexity to them. Uh, if simplification is better, it's quicker, it's easier to train on, why do so few companies gravitate towards simplicity? Why is it so hard? And is it hard to solve? Well, oof. why do they do it? And is it hard to solve us? Let me, let's, let's tackle those in pieces. Why do they do it? it? I think it's inevitable. I think people can't help themselves. Complexity is, is it's entropy. It's the universe is always going to try and make our life more complex. And typically people throw, they throw something at a problem. If you're throwing something at a problem, but you're not trying, you're not doing root cause analysis and actually discovering the root cause, you're layering. Typically, if you're doing root cause, you're simplifying the solution is almost always the simplification of something. If you're not doing root cause and you're trying to solve a, a, an issue that someone brought up, you layer. So layer and layer and layers where you start getting all these dotted lines and that's the solution of things. So the root cause, usually it's not very clear what your role is, what your responsibility is, not very clear what the process is, or what the contract says. I mean, you could just go on and on, right? It's a lack of clarity. Now, why is it hard? Um, let's, talk, let's, par let's pause right there, Gary, because I think there's a couple of things to tease out maybe. One of the things that our clients always say is really helpful through this process is this root cause analysis. You mentioned it on the last call. You mentioned it here. So do I understand you correctly that when a business is facing a challenge, 
the tendency is to throw something new at it as opposed to take away something from it and really get to that root cause. Is that where a lot of this tends to build on each other? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there's a great lesson I learned when I was back in medical products engineering, and it, it, it actually is it's a combination of simplification and, and process, right? We, we were launching a new product and we needed some heightened quality assurance tests during the initial phase. So in medical products, everything's got to be validated. And so part of going to market was we had to do extra statistical sampling. Factory didn't have the, the, the capacity in quality assurance to do so, okay? So the problem was that was in Northern Italy and hiring one extra QA person was like, oh, you're, they're locked in for life. You can't just bring them in for three months and then once your sampling goes down, let them go, right? So we were stuck. So we went to the process component and I, we just asked a bunch of questions. So why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? And we found out that a certain number of hours that this resource was doing was to pull a sample out of a batch of plastic and label it and log it and put it in a container and you know, update the manual and yada, yada, yada. And the question was, well, why are we doing that? And it was a classic because we always did it. Well, do we have to? Long story short, there was absolutely no need any longer to do it. When they instituted it, it was before the, the manufacturers of plastic had to do all that themselves, right? So everything that they thought they needed to do to retain that sample was really not required. We had contracts and we had laws in place that said the people who made the plastic have to produce all that stuff. So nobody ever stopped and asked, why do we continue to do this? It was just inertia. And so by by kind of simplifying a process, if you will, or doing some process analysis, we're able to free up resources to actually get innovative, right? And and it wasn't a layering situation. It was, well, what can we take away before we add, right? This, if in a different situation, we just, well, hire another person and do more testing, yeah. right? And now you got- And that company, body, that company would have been bigger. Yep. It would have had more complexity, yep. right? But by, by being, by having simplification as a core value, right? As a, we're always exactly. trying, before we layer on, let's see if we can take away and solve it. So I, I think that's a really good point that we've seen time and time on client engagements. They always say, well, I need one more thing to solve this problem. And then another thing to solve this problem when really there's a core issue that could solve all the problems. Right. So, yep. so I yeah. think now let's talk about how hard it is to do. Right. Because <laughs> we're walking into an organization. Right. They've got all these all these extra hires that they've made, all these extra processes that may not be a value add anymore. And we're walking in. Why is it so hard to start to peel back some of those layers to talk through that complexity? Why is this such a struggle for organizations, especially smaller ones? Well, for smaller organizations, normally they're, they're moving so fast and they're so busy, it's hard to stop and take a moment and reflect. Um, there's also a lot of, um, this can be emotional. You know, when, when you're asking somebody why they do something, they can feel attacked, right? And they have to defend what they're doing, right? So we're very careful when we're coaching in these moments to, to watch how leaders are questioning the people who are doing the work, right? It's You have to seek to understand. And the best way to seek to understand is really to observe. So it's actually not difficult to do. It's that it can be kind of political or emotionally charged. And so people generally, it's kind of, it's a classic of it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But when do you, what, how do you define broke in that situation, right? So sometimes, well, I'd say oftentimes we recommend bringing in an external to help with that, but you do not hand it off, okay? You're bringing in somebody with process expertise that has an objective outside, you know, viewpoint, right? Can see something with fresh eyes, but you need the people who've been doing it. You need the tribal knowledge, you need the institutional knowledge to make sure that somebody external 
doesn't accidentally remove a part of a process or make a change without the full context. So it's not something you can flip off very easily to somebody else and just go, hey, bring a process expert in and solve it. And it can be emotionally charged on the other side, right? Because they feel like the spotlight's on them. They're doing something wrong. So you kind of have to make it a plan to do it everywhere, all the time. Build it into the muscle, right? It's kind of like spring cleaning, if you will. If you kind of just make it as part of a standard practice and people get used to, okay, we're doing some spring cleaning, right? That's really, if you take that incremental approach, then I think people accept it and, and they can they can embrace it a little bit better. So we really need to approach it from a company-wide methodology standpoint, as opposed to just a breakout topic in a leadership meeting, right? We really need to say, hey, we're looking to simplify organization-wide. Where's the complexity? Because where the complexity is, is probably where the inefficiencies are, right? So any other, any other approaches or methodologies you'd like to talk about on Simplify before we move to Systemize? So I, I, I agree with you in the sense that it should be, you know, system wide, but, but I would just caution, don't tell the organization, Hey, we're now going to simplify everything. It, take it more like maintenance, right? Take it more like, look, this is how we keep our pipes clean. This is how we stay efficient, right? Build it into the normal operating procedure, if you will, of your business operating process, where we're always looking to figure out where we can simplify, right? And and I think there's tons of benefits, like I mentioned before. It, it, yes, it simplify is going to reduce the number of mistakes. Simplify is going to make it easier to hire talent, right? I have so many, so many clients that were killing it and they lost the key, uh, they, they lost a key resource, right? Somebody who was great on their team and they realized, no replacement they can go out and get can really do it because what was happening was so complex, right? It wasn't documented. It wasn't simplified. And now they're stuck. Now they got to go find someone with that exact industry expertise to get the job done. And they've kind of built themselves into a trap, right? So to the extent that you can kind of just have it as a mandate, if you will, we're always going to, love simple instead of complex stop rewarding somebody who comes in with like the new shiny gadget stop making that success start rewarding people who are like hey i just took out a couple of useless steps like celebrate that that's actually a much bigger win for the organization so create a culture of simplification yeah exactly okay so now we're simplifying now we need to put it into a process, right? We, we need to systemize it. We need to, to your point, not rely on one or two key people in a department to run everything. We need to be able to break that down into repeatable processes and systems. Let's talk about uh, systemize and how that can help businesses. Yeah, so systemize is, is one of those that's probably nearest and dearest to my DNA. I started as a manufacturing engineer and when I when I took over the engineering industrial engineering department at Starbucks, what 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 was so painfully obvious to me at that moment was, wait, these are kind of my industrial engineers that that lay out my store to make the store efficient, which is a little drink producing factory. It's that's what Starbucks. If you look at Starbucks, it's a custom drink producing factory, and it's super efficient, by the way. But how are they going to do that from the ivory tower? Right. When I was a manufacturing engineer, I was in the factory. I could go down to the line and I can observe what was going on. So how do you do that? So I literally had my team made a rule. You had to work from a Starbucks store one day a week. Just by being there and observing. That's all we're talking about. We take our core processes and we document them on a high level. But the only way to do that properly is to observe them. So go and sit down, take, pick a process and sit down with the person running the process and just ask questions. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? If you just made a list of I'm not sure. <laughs> if you made a list mm -hmm. of every time you heard somebody say, well, I'm not exactly sure why we do this. That's probably on the evaluate. Right. So you just observe it. You document it. 
And anytime you hear an, I'm not sure, well, that's what you're going to evaluate. Why do we do this step then? If you think about what we do, we tell people seven or eight core processes in your business. Seven or eight are the ones that are adding value. And those processes, 20% of the steps are getting you 80% there. If you think about that, there is massive opportunity to simplify. Right? That's why they, they sit so well together, because if you document your core process, the ones that matter, you document at a high level, and then you just go through them. Why do we do this? I'm not sure why we do that. <laughs> well, probably, maybe we don't need to. And that's it. It's It's simple. It's actually simple to simplify a process if you take that, that, that approach. Get involved, be there, do the work, observe it, ask questions. So with a lot of our clients, Gary, they don't have docu- a handful of documented processes, but they do have a document called an SOP manual that's seven, 800 pages, right? <laughs> and one of yeah. the, we were doing an operational audit recently and as we were asking those questions, right? Hey, within the sales process, what are the steps? The answer kept being from the senior leader, right? Founder, it's in the SOP, right? Call it playbook, call it operation, it's in the SOP. Oh, okay, cool. So on the marketing side, oh, that's in the SOP. And there was finally enough tension in the room that I just asked, okay, can you tell me what page or maybe even just what section of the SOP? And you know the answer, the senior leader is like, I don't know, but it's in there. Just trust me, it's... It's 800 pages. It's got to be in there, right? right? Is that the gorilla we're wrestling with when we start to kind of break this stuff down? Like, what do we do with this 700-page SOP that's obviously not getting us anywhere? It's become a safety blanket for us, right? In senior leadership, we just have the answer. Oh, there's an SOP for that. We don't know where it is. We probably don't know what it is in detail anymore, but we just know that it's there. How do we address that in this framework of simplification and, and working things through a system. Yeah, it's funny. I find, I find, well, there's people who believe that everyone falls into two categories and people who don't, right? So I find that there's two types of companies, ones with like no documentation and ones with way too much, right? Once you start documenting, people think they need to document everything, right? Turn your computer on, launch Windows, open Outlook, open your inbox. It's like, dude, (laughs) stop, right? Just reply to email or get email, right? So the people who have started documenting, that's kind of their proof point and it's their catch-all, right? If I just write it all down, I don't really need to worry about training, right? It's all going to be captured there, but... We know for a fact the instant, especially a complex process, is fully documented, it's obsolete within a week. Something's going to change that's going to make an exception to the rules, and now it's a little inaccurate. And over time, it becomes partially accurate, and then it's nobody really follows that because it's out of date. And but, but remember we talked about the emotional thing? I've met people who've written those really complex documents. I put a ton of hours in it and it's their baby and it's their safety blanket. So I love to throw them away and start over, freaks people out. I usually think it's better to just throw it out, get the process, document the top 20 steps or the 20% of the steps. I think it's a lot faster and, and more efficient than going line by line and questioning everything. But But you have, that's the inertia. That's momentum. So when you have a situation where you have a 700 page document, pick one process, right? And and pick like one subsection of that process and, and start there. And if you can start with one that's more likely causing issues, if you can get it back to, well, we keep running against an issue here. So let's go to fulfillment, right? Since we keep shipping things to the wrong place. Let's go to that part of the process, right? You can you can chunk it down. You don't have to throw it throw the baby out with the bathwater per se. But if you if you begin to chunk it down with the mantra of simplification, 
over time, you're going to, you're going to let go of a bunch of stuff that just doesn't matter. Got it. Yeah, that's super helpful. Taking that 700 page SOP, let's break it down into sections. Obviously, I think you would probably say once you see success with that first subset, it probably creates some excitement around going through the rest of it. I know we're up on time for this conversation. Are there any recommended resources that you have uh, to help people learn about, simplify and systemize any, anywhere you would direct them? Yeah, well, actually, there's a great book. Uh, I'll put it. I'll put it in in the post. Um, yeah. It's written by Mike Patton, and it's called Process. And so, as a guy who's been in process engineering and industrial engineering, done Lean Six Sigma, the whole thing, like there's a lot out there. I love this book because it's simple. There's a three step process documenter, and anybody can take it on any process, and it just explains some very basic steps to take to begin to simplify your processes, document them, and then get them followed by all. all right, if you can document a process at a high level and train it, think about how much easier it is to bring new talent into your team, how much easier it is to manage that team. So anyway, that's a book that I highly really recommend. I'll pop a link um, or a description to that so you guys can find it. Cool. Gary, you'll put that in the post. Uh, if you need the kind of help, if you're in a business that needs the kind of help that Gary and Sirius offer, I just dropped a link to our website where you can fill out a form. One of our team members will be happy to uh, reach out to you, see where you are in the process, get someone in there. As Gary mentioned, a lot of times bringing someone from the outside in with process expertise, you still need the leadership team to talk through these things, but sometimes fresh eyes are good and you take it one step at a time I think all of us, Gary, would agree we would love to work in simpler organizations. Uh, just the idea of that probably makes a lot of us smile. Thanks for your help today. Thanks for being on the call. Gary's going to be back to wrap this series up in two weeks. Uh, the link for that, Christine, has dropped in the uh, chat below. Uh, and then we'll also have that link in the LinkedIn post. Gary, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody.